um, I suppose one of the the reports that really put you guys on the map was the report about Steinhoff International, which is a South African company, mm-hmm. uh, furniture retailer, as far as I know, sold all around the world, one of the biggest companies in South Africa. Mm-hmm. Can you take us through your process, starting from due diligence right through to, I suppose, today, what happened? Sure. Yeah, I think it would just be a fascinating story. Um, so from due diligence, I think it came up on the map when uh, Steinhoff had proposed to buy a mattress firm in the US. And that stuck out to Fraser because I hadn't been to the US that much at the time. Um, it stuck out to Fraser because he's like, I've never seen anyone in those stores. How much money do they make and why are they paying so much for it? Mm. And it was just like this huge valuation. Um, I don't know exactly what it is it's top of my head, but it seemed like it was inflated like two or three times. Right. And it was a related party transaction with... Uh, if I recall, Christoph Weiser, who was the chairman and majority holder of Steinhoff at the time. Um, and I think once we sort of started looking into that, we got into this web of really, really intricate um, undisclosed related parties that we would just find everywhere. And just weird sort of transactions that didn't really amount to like huge sums of money uh, on their financials. But once you aggregated all of these, it was quite substantial in terms of their earnings. Mm -hmm. So when it's sort of months and months into like pulling out financials from all these really, really difficult jurisdictions, um, you know, Europe, I think Bahamas, <laughs> um, the the US, uh, some in Germany, um, and even like a lot of these companies in South Africa, uh, we found that you know a big driver of standoff sales, especially in South Africa, was this sort of consumer financing for furniture, and it looked like all of the debt from the consumer financing in South Africa was just sort of being offloaded for cash. But when we got the filings to see where it was going, it actually looked like Steinhoff was giving a loan to someone to buy the bad debt. Hmm. And I don't think that there was any intention to ever repay that loan. Right. And that in itself amounted to like a huge portion of earnings, even though like it wasn't really substantial in the grand scheme of like revenue. Yep. Uh, so how did you, so do you went into each of these jurisdictions, you were just finding this complex web of companies, effectively shell companies or? Yeah. And there, there were a few, um, and there were a few that sort of, you know, I mean, once we started kind of poking this idea, uh, we get, these anonymous emails that will come and be like, oh, um, I heard you guys were talking to someone about this. Here's what Hmm. I found. And, you know, we had found one related party and there was another one that was sent to us on an email. And collectively, I don't think that that was potentially all of them because we didn't anticipate publishing our report when we did. It was just like, it, it was as it was on the date that PwC quit and Marcus Braun quit that the stock collapsed and we figured, well, shit, may as well publish now mm. because, I mean, I'm not going to keep working on this. The, the thesis has played out. So I, I think from, from our end, it was still incomplete um, and there still potentially could be more digging done. Uh, but the state of affairs now is that you know, they're sort of dragging them through this regulatory process in a bunch of offices in South Africa. But I haven't been following it, you know, super closely. Mm. And so uh, I, I, I think I, I looked this up before I came in, and I think it's the share price is down something like 90% or more. Yeah, I think it was a bit more. Yeah, right. So how big was this company? Like, what would it be akin to here in Australia? Um... I think it was like 16 billion euros, wasn't it? Right. So massive. Hmm. 
Yeah, I think I checked it. It was about 350 million euros, I think, now. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. Don't quote me on the 16 billion. I think it was very, very big. Um, it, it would be like putting JB Hi-Fi, Harvey Norman, and like all of our furniture retailers into like a cluster and listing it. Yeah, right. So pretty big. Yeah, right. And naturally, the fallout from this has been huge, it's especially in South Africa, obviously, because mm-hmm. this is a, a massive company that's... Right, and there's it, a lot of like pension cash invested in it as well. Mm. And banks, international banks that were invested? Banks. Um, and it wasn't... Th- there was one sell-side analyst only that was putting out, I think, negative notes on this company. Okay. F- from memory. And they were so poorly received, even though they were factually right. And it wasn't like super difficult to do the proper due diligence on this. It was time consuming, but uh, even like inspecting the quality of earnings is like an easy thing to do. So the quality of like the cash that's coming in um, and the quality of your customers, especially when you're giving out like unsecured debt for people to buy your stuff. uh, That's like a really easy, you know, risk adjustment. Was that disclosed in the statements? I mean, yeah, they they had a they had a breakdown of you know how much of their loan book went out to as, as unsecured debt, right. um, but this guy turned out to be right, and I don't, and all of these buy side analysts who had been you know continuously like yeah this is a great company, blah blah, blah. Um, that's fine. It, it's they they did they did their research. It wasn't you know factually right, but. They, the the regulatory process that we sort of endured in South Africa on our, our piece um, was pretty crazy considering that, you know, everyone kind of dislikes short sellers or people that write negative reports when in reality, if we treated um, buy reports with the same scrutiny, uh, I think that'd be a very, very different outcome in terms of like how people perceive investment research. For sure. I mean, everyone's happy to keep the, the wagon rolling until right, right, right. Like they're employed, they're making money. And exactly. No one likes to lose money, right? No, and that's, yeah, I think you have to kind of get the emotion out of that and just mm. actually look at this thing fundamentally. Like, what does this business do? 